<clears throat> so this is the sixth day of our seven day uh, retreat on unfettering the natural mind, the path of clear seeing. And hopefully, as we have continued to practice, everyone here, to some degree or another, is experiencing their mind as less fettered. The goal is unfettered. Un the unfettered mind is not, you know, it has its... Uh, its beginning and its end. We can say there is the mind that is absolutely totally fettered and there is the mind that is unfettered. The unfettered mind is the mind of a Buddha. Uh, but that being said, because of the uh, nature of this mind that we have been learning about, because of the nature of impermanence and insubstantiality that we have been learning about and you know about, uh, the potential in every moment is to show up fettered or unfettered. No matter how many fetters you have, <laughs> since none of them have any substantiability at all, every time uh, you uh, feel fettered, in that moment you can unfetter yourself. That is something also we've been learning here. If you are learning how to show up in the moment, unfettered, wonderful. If you're showing up in the moment, fettered, I hope by now you're getting to know the difference between being fettered and unfettered, being, being tethered and untethered, between being chained and not chained being bound and boundless. You have to know what these mind states, feeling states are like, so you know what's going on. Right? If you've always lived in chains, right? if the dog has always been tethered, it thinks that's normal. It thinks that's normal. Uh, even perhaps the dog that has always been tethered uh, from its puppyhood, uh, when you take it off its tether, it might just uh, stand there. It's all it knows. It no longer needs the, uh, you know, the, the tether to bind it. The imprint is there. It's like these, uh, you know, people get for their dogs these invisible fences, right? uh, which uh, in the early stages, when the dog doesn't uh, kind of get it, it gets a little shock when it gets to the uh, boundaries, right? But once the dog learns it, it just never goes beyond the boundaries. Right? Right? You could have stopped that service uh, years ago. The dog still doesn't go outside it. It's been conditioned to its tether, to its enclosure. Uh, that, is, that is unfortunately uh, the way uh, many of us are. We don't understand our tethering, we don't understand our conditioning. We take it as real and we, uh, you know, we act as if it's real. Many people uh, early on in childhood uh, uh, developed the tether of uh, protection and safety because they were a child. You know, now it's 40, 50 years later and they're still hiding behind the wall. And they think that's normal to be, to protect themselves because they can't handle. That's a tether. And it's a mind-created tether. It's not real. The self that's being protected is not real. There's no self that needs protection or safety. 
and the artificial strategies we have developed uh, to keep this uh, this unreal self uh, safe, uh, which is unreal, uh, are also unreal. You cannot see any of these things, these things that we have erected in our mind and we think are real. So this practice, that is why this, these teachings and practices have the power to liberate us. Is that clear? That is why they are the most precious. Because these direct teachings that you've been able to receive uh, in this retreat, as we've said so easily, so easily, and because, as I said yesterday, we've received them so easily, we can take them for granted. We could not really value them. As if we have, you know, if we had crawled across the desert to get them, endured all kinds of hardships and everything, then when we finally got, got them, we, <laughs> we would value it because we valued the difficulty of getting them. Uh, but because things come so easy to us these days, uh, we don't realize what a precious gift uh, we have gotten. Uh, as I said from the beginning, uh, the teachings on cause and effect, the teachings on the preciousness of human life, the teachings on the suffering of human existence, and what was the other one? Impermanence. And impermanence. Uh, uh, all these teachings, these fundamental, wonderful teachings about uh, uh, that have been handed down to us, help us understand the nature of uh, the kind of world, right? When you combine those teachings, which explains so clearly the nature of uh, the world that we live in and clearly separate for us the wheat from the chaff, the gold from the mud, right. the diamonds from the uh, cubic zirconia. When we combine those teachings with these other whole body of teachings that teach us about the nature of the mind, about thoughts and feelings and perceptions, right? That, that whole mechanism by which we have incorporated our delusive encounter with the world, we have incorporated within ourselves as the way we operate and see and exist and emote in life. So when you put those two together, these teachings on the nature of life, uh, the nature, cause and effect, et cetera, et cetera, and you combine them with these teachings on the nature of the mind, you have the path to liberation. Is that clear? There's no reason uh, any anymore to uh, trod the dark paths in life. We're shown clearly uh, it's all shown clearly to us. Is that clear? I mean, does anybody uh, not agree or doubt that? Uh, so, so again, uh, the only thing we need to do is practice. That is the only thing. I mean, it's that simple. All we need to do is practice them. We need to study them, hear them, so we learn them and understand them, uh, both into intellectually and, and, and the methodology of it. I understand it. We need to reflect deeply on it so it, it really sinks in. And our understanding is deeper than the cognitive. It's, it's because we've really chewed on these teachings. We're not just self-satisfied with a little intellectual understanding. We chew on them. We really make sure that they accord with our experience uh, and our understanding about life. And then we put them into practice. Right? And when you put them into practice, you know, you've entered the journey uh, that thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions and maybe tens of millions of people have followed for, uh, you know, for at least 2,600 years in this uh, world cycle. Uh, and that, you know, generation after generation brings people to enlightenment, brings people to liberation, and at the very least uh, brings them to a, a, a life of ease and uh, happiness and goodness, you know, at the very least. 
Um, so please, um, please ponder that. So over the course of these uh, six days now, we have uh, been uh, uh, not just hearing the teachings about uh, the mind, uh, but we've also been uh, practicing them, practicing them morning, noon, and night. Uh, Returning to the third Dzogchen Rinpoche, Pith Instructions in Dzogchen. Just a reminder that in the searching for the mind, he said, in short, investigate the mind you are searching for and then turn your attention back to the mind that is doing the searching. This is very important, okay? Because when you are searching, and again, the searching the searching is both an investigative tool to produce understanding about things in relationship to the structures of our mind, uh, although things that we think are structured <laughs> are real concrete uh, things. Uh, but if, if, those, if that investigation is done uh, with mindfulness and concentration, which means absorption, uh, they also, the, 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 the practice of uh, searching the mind uh, becomes sort of a um, a shovel in which you're digging down deeper into the mind. So when you are finished with your searching, you feel like you've come to the end of examination, the reason you can rest there is because hopefully in your searching, you have kind of, you know, left the surface. Remember the surface of the mind? and you have dug more deeply underneath the thoughts into deeper levels of the mind, okay? You are, you are coming down to the very ground of the mind, the base of the mind, the mirror-like quality of the mind, the open, spacious quality of the mind. Just by your examination, is that clear? That's why the examination has to be done over and over and has to be done with great mindfulness and concentration so that when you do come to the state of relaxing, you are in this place of open spaciousness. Is that clear? Open spaciousness, space-like mind is the, is the theme of this level of practice. Okay. Many of us, when we, when we uh, conceive of our mind, it, it's almost like living in a, uh, not quite a dollhouse, like something tiny, you know what I mean? <laughs> or like sometimes you go to these uh, kind of old colonial houses and you walk in, you go, wow, the ceilings are so low and the rooms are so tiny, you know what I mean? You go, it's like that, you know? <laughs> There, it's like like that. And so many of us, our minds are like that. It's just filled with all kind of little compartments and tiny little rooms, and we're always kind of constricted in them. You know, we, we, we never feel, you know, open and spacious. It's not like this room, right? This is, a, this is a room that has space in it, right? Things can move around in it. We can all move around in it nice and easy, can't we? Right? But if we walked in this room and it was like, uh, you know, nine feet wide, or <laughs> as many feet long, we'd be walking around like this, right? Very tight. We'd be all bumping into each other. We'd be grumpy, cranky. <laughs> right? Because, and we think it's, the, you, but we don't realize it's because it's such a tight space and everything is rubbing up against everything else. Our thoughts are all just tight. Our emotions are tight, right? And we're just like in this little narrow place all the time. You know, it's like also like a place uh, where there's no sunlight. It's always kind of dark and murky in there. Okay, so uh, to to begin to understand that that is just the upper level of the mind, the waves. 
and to really learn how to go more deeply where you just, you know, as, as Spence, our guinea pig, said, right? Spence, the great intellectual who never stops thinking, all of a sudden he went, what? Just like, a, just like a, you know, somebody taking a drug or something. He went, wow, <laughs> right? Wow. Now this thing is big. Right? Doesn't seem to have an end. I mean, it's like just well, okay. It's like it's, it's spacious. You see, it's spacious. It's open. And when you experience that as the nature of your mind, and you learn to live from that, you can see what a difference it makes. Because now there's plenty of room for thoughts to just come and go, feelings to just come and go. Right? They're not. You know, now a thought arises, it immediately connects with, bounces into another thought, connects with another thought, grabs onto an emotion, mental formation comes up, you know, it's like, nah, nah, you know, and before you know it, you're just grinding it out again. Right? Right, Spence? Day after day, just grinding it out. As opposed to, again, Space, spaciousness. So this uh, capacity, uh, and, and we did that a little bit last night. I mean, usually that's space gazing we do outside. It's a wonderful practice. But again, uh, again, like this is a good example. You see, we're in a room where the predominant quality of this room is what? Empty space. I mean, that is the, that is the biggest quality of this room. And yet, we don't notice that. We just notice each other. Right? We, 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 we notice the things that are in the space. That's where all our attention is. Is that clear? We, we, we don't notice, we, we go outside, again, vast spaciousness in between everything, every leaf, every, there's space. Right? But we don't notice that, we notice the objects. Right? So when you begin to either, you know, and you can do that even physically, you can begin to notice space space around things, space, and, it, and it changes the dynamic of the way you relate to things because they don't appear so solid. It's like having a soft panoramic gaze. You sort of see everything, but you're not like that on everything. See, we're like that on everything. So you want to soften your gaze, but you most importantly want to soften your gaze in your mind. Is that clear? And this cultivation of space and openness is, is a key practice in, in tradition. That is why you keep hearing what? Rest. Relax the mind. Rest the mind. Because it is tight. It is constricted. It's what's it tight and constricted around? Thoughts, feelings, perceptions, the objects it sees. It's just grabbing onto everything. Right? Relax it. Right? Why do you go to the massage therapist? Why, why, why do you get a massage? Anybody ever get a massage? You get a massage, why? To relax. And what does your massage therapist say to you, uh, Robbie? You're so tight. <laughs> right? I mean, they earn a living that way, right? So it's, right. You're so tight. Relax, right? That's, so we have to pay somebody to do it. But that's, again, and when you, when they point out, you know, and again, you might have been walking around like that all week thinking that this is kind of normal. Then they push a couple of points and you realize, wow, I really am tight. Right? And then you get a good massage and how do you feel at the end? Great. Because you are what? You're relaxed. You're loose. Your your muscles are relaxed. Your body's relaxed, it's, right? And it feels great. It's it's the same with the mind. It's got to be softened. It's got to be relaxed. So it and it will just naturally feel good because there's space. There's openness. And these thoughts and feelings that we, it's such a big deal and we take so seriously, you know, our stuff, we take so seriously. And every little event that pops into our mind, we take so seriously. Right. So, so this is important. Please, I just want to say it again. I mean, we did say it. So in, in short, investigate the mind you are searching for. So again, we investigate the mind. We investigate the self. All the things that we have been doing, and we examine, examine, all the categories of investigation. 
but at the end, you turn it on the investigator, okay? Because the delusion, can, in other words, that which is saying, I can't find anything, right? That which is saying, my mind is empty, right? right? That which is saying, um, the self doesn't exist. That which is saying, wow, my mind is spacious and open, right? Well, what is that? Right? Maybe that's yourself. It seems to be aware of all this, right? What's that? Whose voice is that, right, Jalissa? Whose voice is that? It's not the little tiny voice anymore, but it's still a voice going, hmm. No self, spacious openness everywhere. <laughs> wow, this is great. <laughs> You know, is this, you know, so we've now got a better self now? We have a Dharma self, but it still, it still feels like there's something, can you see? So that's why the next step is to, is to turn, just finally turn and look right at that which is, right, describing all that. What is that? And then you turn your attention back to the mind that is doing the searching. You will then behold the mind in its original state and see that it has no identifiable essence at all. Until this actually has come to pass, you should repeat this process of examination over and over again. Okay? Again, please remember, Buddhism is very interesting. It does not say the self does not exist, right? It says the self that appears to exist upon examination is seen to be a non-self. Okay. So things appear, right? It feels like there's somebody in here, right? Doesn't it? It feels like there's somebody in here. There's somebody who's thinking, there's somebody who's feeling, there's somebody who's listening to this Dharma talk, right? It kind of seems that way, doesn't it? Even if we're not thinking the I thought, right? It still feels that way. So we have to keep examining to see because we could take that feeling of there's a self here as something solid rather than just an appearance of. Is that clear? I mean, this is tricky, but it's very essential. It's, it's not that, it's like, again, you see that the emperor has no clothes. Right. That's why it's often said, you know, it's like a bubble. It appears, but then it pops and there's nothing there. It's like an echo. Right. You know, all, all the similes in the Diamond Sutra. Right. It's like a rainbow. All these things. It's like that. It gives the appearance of something being there, but upon examination, again, like we, we analytically did the examination with the flower, and the wonderful thing about our mind is that we can do it directly. It doesn't just have to be analytical. So that is why the realization is transformative. You will then behold the mind in its original state and see that it has no identifiable essence at all. Until this has actually come to pass, you should repeat this process of examination over and over again. And here he says, continue this process and to determine the consciousness. And here he's talking about the consciousness that is doing the investigation. Lacks inherent existence, has no basis or root, while it nevertheless knows and perceives, which is what Bill said. Right? He said, and yet something knows. Something knows, something is saying, I'm, you know, vast and empty, spacious. There is a knowing, right? And again, as opposed to our intellectual, conceptual way of knowing, our, 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 our true mind has this incredibly wonderful capacity, this natural intelligence and way of knowing. It is the knowing before thought. It is the knowing that comes from knowing a thing. And everybody in here has that. It has probably been guiding you and you haven't even known it. So you're too busy trying to figure it out. <laughs> you gotta figure out my life. Mm -hmm. 
Now, uh, <laughs> does the bellmaster want some attention? <laughs> So again, as we have said earlier, uh, there are all the reflections, uh, all the work you have done in the level of remedies and, and antidotes, you know, that, that can still be in your medicine bag, okay? But now we're just practicing at a different level. It doesn't mean uh, that if needed, you don't take those medicines out. You don't take those remedies out. Okay. So, so this practice at this level has, has these two main pieces, right? One piece is the examination, right? And the second piece is the resting in the natural state. Okay? One practice helps us to see the utter delusion or falsity of our concepts about who we are, what is the mind, what are thoughts, right? And so by constantly seeing the empty nature of all the phenomena of the mind, right? Hopefully over time, things, you know, we, we, we're not let about anymore because we know, right, that it's just a thought. Not like we know it's a thought because we say it's a thought, because we know the nature of thought. What is the nature of thought? Insubstantiality. We know, we know the nature. See, if we, 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 we think we're so smart, we go, oh, it's just a thought. Oh, I know that. You know, until I get hooked by the next one and the next one. Right? The truth is we don't know, we don't, we don't really know until we know when we know the nature of a thought. You see? When you know the nature of a thought, then there's a much better chance you will not get hooked. When you know the nature of the self, that it's a non-self, that there's nothing there, then the, all the schemes and schemas and strategies that you have developed around this self will just melt away because that which is uh, creating this whole uh, superstructure, <laughs> you know, is, is, is not real. Like, I don't need any strategies to advance and protect and defend and get noticed and get loved and get liked, and, right? And get this and get that. That's all about what? Self. And there's no self in any existent way. Is that clear? So, you know, over time, you, you can really let go. All right, so this is the work that's going on over here. You see that work? Okay. Now, you see? This is the interesting thing. See, now, expense, if I'm not spending all my time, you know, on the upper levels of the mind, just endlessly, you know, in, 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 in my tight little house, you know, working my strategies, right? Well, what am I going to do? Enjoy. Yeah, enjoy. How do we enjoy? Cultivating the spacious, aware mind. Right? Learning to rest in our true mind. You know, we, you know, people talk about the spiritual path, you know, returning home. Anybody ever heard that? Mm -hmm. Right, there are even songs about that. Right? <laughs> but this is what it means. Our true home is our own Buddha mind, free of any constrictions, free of any constructions. Right? This is our true home. This is the home we need to, uh, first like we've done in this retreat, first we need to recognize it, have a glimpse of it, know that it's there, and then we need to learn to live there, to dwell there as much as we can. The more, the more, the more, the more we dwell there, the more we get used to it, we get familiar with it. And over time, it becomes more and more our home. When you have a nice home, you don't always want to go out. Right? <laughs> if you don't have a nice home, you know, any excuse in the world to, to go out, right? When you have a nice 
spacious, comfortable home that you feel very relaxed and happy in. You stay home a lot, don't you? Right? So the same way, you know, coming, what's that coming and going? Is that for what? The verse on the face of mine? Coming and going, we never leave home. Right? Where's that from? Or is that Taku and Zenji? No, no, yeah, well, there's no, it's the same, but, yeah. but I think it's the, the song of Zazen. Coming and, coming and going, they never leave home. So again, in the teachings on um, resting in the natural state, uh, I realized yesterday, and it, it's just a small difference, that actually Dzogchen Rinpoche was quoting different texts. It wasn't all the same text. So there is a little difference, and I just want to make sure I didn't confuse anybody. Uh, he said, first, and this is the clear expanse, which must be some sort of text, Disturbances in the body, speech, and mind, and elements are released by resting in the natural state. As stated before, once you become worn out by practicing all the preliminary practices, you should rest. Let the weary traveler rest in the mind itself, free of elaborations. Right? And in this case, you do not involve yourself in anything. Okay? Easy? Anybody be trying it? It's easy, but it's easy to get hooked. <laughs> so it's easy, but it's easy to get hooked. So, uh, you know, to be able to uh, establish yourself in this natural wakefulness of mind and completely be undisturbed sound sites, anything internal, external arises, you don't even, uh, you know, there's no kind of movement toward. Right. It's called the mind moving toward an object, either external or internal. Right. Uh, but then he, he quotes a different text, which, he, which is called the Last Testament. And in that text, it says about resting in the natural state, you should meditate by focusing your mind one-pointedly on whatever manifests, regardless of whether it is a samsaric thought that would ordinarily be eliminated or a virtuous thought that would function as a remedy. This, remember this, with so complete about this will, this will bring about a fundamental transformation of the thoughts, turning the conceptual into the non-conceptual, just as murky water becomes clear all on its own, left untouched. So there's a little bit of a, a difference here, right? In the other, you're just completely sort of unfocused, right? On this one, there is a little more uh, kind of just looking directly at whatever arises. Can you see the subtle difference? Uh, you know, uh, usually this one is sort of the preliminary to the next one, or this one could be sort of combined with the other one. Uh, so they don't become absolutes, you know, like you're either in it or you're not. In other words, you may be uh, practicing resting rest unfabricated, but if you find that the mind is beginning to move to something, uh, you may just look right at it, right? Just look at that thought, and then it will just dissolve. So there's a little, can you see, there's a little bit of action, but it's very slight, right? You're not pulling out your remedies. You're not saying, it's only a thought. Let it go, Fred. You see, that's a remedy. That's using a fabrication to get rid of a fabrication. Right? You know, the gaze, the looking. And again, the capacity just to rest in awareness and not to move toward any uh, fabrication at all, but just to let it be, is often predicated on all the work you've done over here with all your examination, right? You, you're kind of beginning to get it. They're just thoughts. They're all empty. Good ones, bad ones, high ones, low ones, ones about me, ones about her, me, you. It's all the same, right? So this work supports, you know, your capacity not to... Okay? I just wanted to say that. 
and then he says in the two segments what I didn't as I was kind of skipping yesterday I didn't I didn't until I read it more carefully realize that he's quoting different texts right even though it's all sort of in the same area uh, so I want to I want to just clarify that there are special hells for Dharma teachers who lead their students astray so <laughs> So it's really for selfish reasons today that I'm uh, uh, <laughs> clarifying things. And so it was in these in this uh, text called the Two Segments teaches a similar skillful approach. Again, you see, I was kind of I was thinking they were all part of one text. Uh, and this is where he said, as attachment is what binds one to the world, attachment itself will bring liberation. You remember and we talked about that yesterday. And then from another text, which is called Distinguishing the Middle from Extremes, uh, he quotes, based on observation, non-observation takes place. And based on non-observation, non-observation occurs. Okay. This is like the uh, verses on the faith mind, you know, or verses on faith, what do we call it now? Trust in mind. Uh, you know, if this is not yet clear to you. <laughs> so this is, this is one of those, right? Okay. So what does that mean? So based on observation, it's like with the attachment, right? So let's say uh, you are observing your mind, right? Okay. So we would say, you know, I'm observing my mind. But when you look directly at that thing you're calling observing my mind, there's no such thing as observing one's mind. Right? There's no such thing as observing the mind. So at that moment, your observation, which appears to be an observation, is really a non-observation. That's what it means. It's, it's a little, I mean, it's, 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 it's a logical kind of conundrum, but it's, does it make sense? That's, that's what it's saying. It, it's again, it's the same thing about in the Heart Sutra. Things appear, but when you look at it, you see that they're not what they are. An attachment becomes a non-attachment because an attachment, there's no such thing as an attachment. So an attachment is a non-attachment. Right? When you, when you look into its nature, right? That's what we say. The self appears to be a, a solid thing, but when you look into it, you see that your self is a non-self. Right? The rainbow is not a real thing. By the way, I am surprised... I am very surprised that this very weird thing up on the altar here has been up here for six days and nobody has sent me a note about it. <laughs> I mean, I mean, for those of you who have been around the Buddhist world at all, have you ever seen anything like this? What? Well, you've seen it in my house cheater. <laughs> right? Has anybody taken a look at this? You've never seen anything like this unless you've seen something like this. But most of the time, for those of you who, who haven't seen it before, so this means those of you wise guys and girls who know the answer, don't give the answer. For those of you who have never seen anything like before, what do you think it is? What is that thing? And why is it doing up on a Buddhist altar? Right? I mean, like the Buddha, we, we understand, right? The, 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 the statue, right? We understand the, that. But what is, what is that painting? It looks... I'm not talking about this, I'm talking about oh, the painting. The painting, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. See how important precise instructions are. Yeah. Okay, I'm talking about that which is called the painting. I'm sorry. That's the, because I call the whole thing the altar. Okay, the painting. 
for those who've never seen a painting like that, what is that? Any idea? I thought it was like a rainbow, something you can't grasp. Okay, well don't describe it yet. It looks like a rainbow to you. Is that what it looks like to other people? Well, she's right. It is a rainbow, but you haven't seen the whole thing. If you look into that rainbow, what do you see in it? It's hard, you're being far away. Come look later. Cinderella. No, not Cinderella. There is a very detailed person in that rainbow. And that person is a gentleman by the name of Padmasambhava. And in, uh, in the Tibetan tradition, uh, in the same way for those who are familiar with Chan or Zen, uh, there is this Indian uh, by the name of Bodhidharma who brought uh, Zen uh, teachings and there are other uh, Indian uh, teachers who brought uh, uh, Buddhism to China and other places. Uh, one of the primary uh, uh, deliverers of Buddhism uh, to Tibet was this... Uh, uh, he actually was from Odiana, which they think is more close to uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan. At that point, those are all Buddhist areas, Kashmir up in that kind of corner area. Uh, his name was Padmasambhava. And Padmasambhava uh, is uh, directly linked uh, with the Dzogchen teachings. He, was, he is considered the one who brought the Dzogchen teachings to Tibet. Okay? So this is a, actually a painting... Of, this is a representation. He's in the rainbow, and this is called uh, this is called uh, Padmasambhava's rainbow body. So it has very special meaning, as I think those who've been on retreat here for the last six days understand, because his body, which you can, which we get close, you can see, is very finely detailed in it and yet it appears like a rainbow. It appears to be a solid thing, and yet, in essence, it is empty. So that's a very special kind of representation of Padmasambhava in uh, this Dzogchen tradition. settles in the natural state without forming any concepts concerning appearances, emptiness. Again, like, oh, yeah, this is all empty. <laughs> this is all this, or I'm feeling this. Try not to have any concepts about where you are. Again, it's like we talked and we've been talking. Uh, somebody came to me yesterday and said, wow, this has been such a wonderful day. I just took the I out of all my activities. Rather than I am walking, just walking. Rather than I am seeing, just see. Rather than I am eating, just eating. And this person said, it just kind of like transformed my day. Taking the self, the object, self and object, subject and object, uh, out of it. So one wants to stop labeling. Okay. That is another very pernicious activity of the mind. Again, uh, if in our work, uh, many of us have work, <laughs> uh, where labeling is, uh, is, is part of the work. It is a necessary part of the work, right? And there's also a certain amount of labeling that we have to do in life. Uh, but a lot of our labeling is uh, unneeded. Like somebody was saying yesterday, uh, they look around the room, and they have not just only a label, but a story around everyone, right? And it's all being projected by our minds. It's just a story. It's not real. Our stories about anybody are not real. And if anything, they can be distorted, they can be very narrow, they can be very one-dimensional, because our thinking mind is, is sort of a one-dimensional mind. 
you know, uh, thoughts are, don't have many gradations of meaning. So as soon as we say uh, that person's like that, it's like the whole universe and complexity of who that person really is, you know, we've missed completely because we've just put a little label on them, attached a little concept to them. Now again, it is a wonderful practice to stop labeling. Just look. Just be present too. That's what we talk about, being present too, right? Don't we hear that? Be present. Just be present. All you can do is be present. Take that on over and over. Just be present. Don't have to label. You don't have to have a concept about everything. Right? I mean, for those of you who have walked the road, for those of you who have been down in the cabins or the tents, for those of you who've gone on walks, right? How many trees have you passed? Do you have a story about every tree? Do you have a label about every tree? Oh, there's the one I like. There's the one I don't like. There's the one that's really too, uh, too big. There's the one that's really too small. There's the one that's not straight. There's the one, right? There's the, that, there's the one when I, yesterday I thought that about today. Right? I mean, that shows you, you can be in nature and enjoy it very much just by being what? Present. Let it reveal itself as it is. Right. I mean, if you took a walk and all you did was label and think about everything you're so, seeing, you know, you might as well stay home because you're not seeing anything. You're just experiencing your thoughts, right? And that's the way we live life with people. We're just endlessly thinking about them, right? Labeling, categorizing, comparing. Do you see? It's, it's, it robs life of any, of any spontaneity. Right? So please understand this process that we do where we just label and develop conceptions that become little stories more developed, that become dramas and melodrama. You know what I mean? It's just all being fabricated by our minds. It's not real. Right? And not only is that you know, what, the, what I just said, but it also then prevents us from really relating to people in a real way, including ourselves, that we also have lots of stories about. I mean, we can't even be at home with ourselves without having all kinds of, this is who I am, this is who I'm not, this is, right, this is, right? That's just more the same. Natural state means uncontrived. Well, resting denotes simply letting be, resting in the natural state. Um, now he says, the signs of progress in this practice are as follows. When you are physically resting in the natural state, you have no desire to move, right? So Robbie, when you've had your nice massage and the massage therapist at the end will say to you something like, well, you just stay there a little bit, you don't have to get up quickly, right? And you don't feel like jumping right up, do you? You just, you're relaxed, right? So when you're physically resting in the natural state, you have no desire to move, you're, you're at peace, right? When you're verbally resting in the natural state, you will not want to speak. And by letting your mind rest in the natural state, all forms of discursive thinking will be purified on their own and vanish. Until these signs actually occur, persevere in this practice. Okay. Now, let me just say, uh, before uh, people get a distorted view, you know, tr traditionally, these kinds of practices and perhaps many of the people who were reading these texts were people on long retreats, okay? Long retreats. Uh, I mean, you know, and especially uh, Tibetans just 
you know, three years, five years, 10 years, 15 years, that was just like, you know, the beginning, you know what I mean? So, you know, so when they say about all your discursive thinking will be purified on their own and vanish, we're talking about a process that is occurring over time, okay? In situations where that's pretty much all you're doing. Okay? I only say that because people like us, lay people, read these things and we think, you know, that's going to happen to us. There may be people here it will happen to. Uh, but again, uh, because uh, of the nature of our lives, where there is a constant level of stimulation, again, which everybody in here can control somewhat. I mean, we can all begin to bring, you know, the amount of stimulation uh, that we are freely choosing to involve ourselves in. You know, we can control that, you know, but even uh, if we do bring that down significantly, uh, for many of us, just the type of culture we live in and our work, there is a, you know, a, a certain to a greater degree of, uh, you know, conceptual stimulation. Is that clear? So uh, the idea that somehow in your evening meditation, uh, you're going to bring, you know, all discursive thinking is going to come to an end uh, will probably uh, not occur, okay? But at the same time, uh, you know, you have to expect some results, right? And so the mind will quiet down, right? The intensity and the number of thoughts will decrease. Can you is that, is that clear? And and you know that's that's where you want to be looking for progress, quote unquote, in your practice, not the absolute. It's really from where you've been. Oh, yeah, my my mind is quieter. Right? Yeah, things aren't as intense. My emotional things are not as intense as they were. As they were. They don't last as long. Yeah, I can let go of my, my day and the activity of my day much easier than I used to, right? So things like that. And then he says, on this topic, the perfection of knowledge state. So again, these are all different texts. You know, I was quoting, engaging in the yogic practice of the perfection of knowledge, this is what we're doing, is to, in, because this, we're gaining the knowledge of the nature of the mind, is to engage in the yogic practice of space, which is sort of what I was talking about earlier. Now, in the, clear, in the, in the text, The Clear Expanse, it says the benefits of resting in the natural state is that all disturbance in the elements will be pacified as, as will circumstances that lead to illness and fixation will be self-liberated. As stated here, resting in the natural state physically, verbally, and mentally serves both temporal and ultimate functions. On the temporal level, our physical and our and our our mouths and our minds and our elements will learn to be undisturbed and because of the nature of uh, traditional medicine that saw a very close correlation of mind and body uh, they write uh, that in turn will ensure that circumstances leading to illness do not occur okay. so you can take that for what it is This practice also performs a function of letting the aggregates, the elements, and the sense fields all rest in their original condition, which allows bodhicitta to develop. Right. So if we are not constantly stirring up because of our, again, our sense objects see, but because we are always grabbing on to what we see or pushing away what we're attracted, we're averting, uh, because our sense consciousness and our mind consciousness are endlessly generating thoughts, et cetera, et cetera, and there's lots of emotionality. You know, where is there any time and space for our bodhicitta, for our awakened mind to come forth? Okay? So what he's saying, as there is this diminution, as there is this quieting down, as we're just letting things be more, as we're not constantly labeling and have opinions, you know, this is, you know, trust in the mind, as that is all quieting down, now there is more space for our, our awakened nature just to come forward in a natural way. Does that, the student understand it? It's now there's space. See, we don't realize that 
with all our concepts that we have been cultivating, all our ideas and beliefs and uh, about ourselves and everything else in it, that it's almost like we have a, a, a shell that we are uh, encased in. And that's why nothing can really get in or out in any significant way. To, so we need to break out of that. Right. And that creates this open space that now things can move. Right. Now our true nature can come forward. Our natural intelligence can come forward. Our true innate wisdom can come forward. Right. Because it's not encased in this endless... Uh, a drama of conceptualization that we are involved in, right? 24-7. How could anything new come in? How, think, how could anything spontaneous and natural occur? mind rest in the natural state all thoughts will be liberated on their own and one will be able to settle naturally into the natural great perfection a state that transcends thought and expression the ultimate supreme function of this practice is to bring about the self-purification of clinging related to ordinary body speech and mind hmm? so Our first day or second day. What's this? What's the Joan Baez song that you let it be? Now I don't know whether the writer of that song was a Dzogchen practitioner or was just wishful thinking. Uh, let it be. Let it be. walk around, let things be. Don't grab at them. The mind grabs at them by it goes towards it. Toward attachment or clinging. And we can cling in attachment uh, in a positive way or we can cling in attachment and aversion. Right? We can obsess about good things and we can obsess about bad things. Right? Our obsessive mind couldn't care less. Right? Learn to let things be. Let things sort themselves out. Let people sort themselves out. Let situations sort themselves out. Right? And if we are going to act, let us act from clarity and wisdom and true compassion. Right? So learning to let things be externally and learning to let things be internally, which is what we're practicing, right? A no. thought arises, let it be. A feeling arises, let it be. We don't have to do anything because its very nature is that it will disappear on its own. We have, when you do that, you are taking the sting. There's no sting left. grab the rattlesnake, it will bite you. But if you let it be, it probably won't. If you just stop. Somebody mentioned yesterday about the bee, right? If you, if you just let the bee be, let the bee be, <laughs> uh, it will just move on. But if you try to swat it, it's a good chance you might get bitten. Let it be. It is very hard for us. But as you can see, the let it be that is sung about, which is really in relationship to life, you really learn how to do it because you understand that the grasping at things, the wanting not to let things be, begins in the mind. And when one has solved that problem in the mind, then letting it be in the phenomenal world becomes much easier. Things be. A feeling comes up. Yeah. 
you know, and most of it's the afflictive ones, but even the positive ones we want to grab onto. Let things be. If that which you call a little worry or anxiety comes up, don't grab onto it. Don't intensify it through worry and obsession. But don't manipulate it. Don't push it away. Don't get rid of it. Don't get disappointed. Here it comes again. Why am I going to deal with it again? I'm so sick of dealing. You know, all you're doing in all that is just intensifying it. Let it be. It will unwind. Why will it unwind? Because that is its nature. That is the nature of emotions. That is the nature of thoughts. They have no substance, and they're all impermanent. Everything just comes and goes. Just let it come and go. Don't be so reactive. Be at ease. problems associated with failing to rest in the natural state are the opposite of all the excellent qualities just mentioned. You should persevere in this practice until the signs of progress have actually manifested. So any, any questions? This is our um, sixth day of retreat. Uh, tonight will be our final night of retreat. So uh, Again, uh, there's been uh, lots of uh, wonderful practice here, lots of, uh, uh, of wonderful teaching we've been fortunate to receive from uh, our ancestors. Uh, and so, uh, again, everyone here uh, at this time tomorrow will be on their way. You don't need to think about it today. <laughs> The future that looks so wonderful to you now was the past that you wanted to get away from and brought you here. But the mind will dress it up. Please watch your minds. You know, we have a precious day here today. This is a wonderful opportunity we have. We have less than 24 hours to go. So please really, uh, uh, you know, utilize this time well. Yes, so any questions about the practice? Yes. So first of all, thank you for bringing it down to the level that is very practical. Um, but I have a question about the ultimate, which is uh, being in a non-conceptual state, being in a state of non-self. I can imagine that uh, mortal human beings like myself, the life is enough, can attain this for a few minutes of uh, meditation or maybe a little longer. But uh, it is, is it correct that understanding life and being live continuously in this state? And if that is true, how would they relate to the world around them? Well, again, uh, you know, if you're asking a mere mortal like me, uh, you know, Yes, it is said, that is the mind of a Buddha, right? And so if you asked, how does the mind of a Buddha, uh, what does it look like? You know, when uh, a self has been totally eradicated, not just uh, in, a, in an insight, but that actually has been eradicated from the mind, so that all, uh, all, all actions and all uh, anything that arises is not tinged with self, it looks like the actions of the Buddha. What did the Buddha do? How did he spend his life after his great enlightenment? He just taught. He just wandered about, you know, sharing himself and sharing his understanding, helping any way he can. And that seems to be uh, what happens. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you look at all the great masters for 2,600 years in this tradition, that seems to be what happens. You know, you know when they've uh, come to great realization and it's really been perfected and they're in that state, all they want to do is share it with others. You know, why is that? Because, you know, they've discovered, you know, something quite wonderful and they see everybody else scurrying around, right? 
you know, trying to find happiness or peace of mind, you know, and all this. You know, what was it? Looking for love in all the wrong places. It's sort of like that. Right? So that seems to be, uh, again, uh, there, there is a kind of realization and understanding that comes in deep meditation. Right? And that is why in the Dzogchen, and we'll get into it tomorrow, the, the, the practice that goes on in formal meditation, which is, again, these ideal experimental conditions, and then the practice that goes on in daily life is somewhat different, just for the reasons that are obvious. There's just uh, so much more going on, a lot more activity, and, uh, you know, more need for, for referencing this self that is not a self in a certain way. Okay. Good. Other questions? Yes, Steve, and then we'll... So um, I believe that one of the things I've been trying to practice in the past day was from the part that you read that was from the two segments, the, the, the passage where it said being wakefulness and then the thought comes up whether it's samsara or not, the, just attend to it or to look right at it. Well, yeah, don't tend to it. I, I tend, like, I put attention on it. All right, yeah, yeah, okay, you can be aware of it, right? That's, right, that's what it said, to single-mindedly just look right at it, and let it... Right, disappear as it will, and then you just rest in that disappearance of. So, so at least my experience in the past day with the way I was trying to do that, I would, I would try to cultivate the wakefulness that you described. Mm -hmm. the, just beginning with the mm -hmm. expanding the visual field and attention, mm -hmm. and, that, mm -hmm. and then I would try to just remain there. And when something would come up, or I would notice something come into the mind. Uh, I would just try to, like literally look at it, and I've noticed at least in this context, in this past day, it really would just dissolve. I couldn't mm -hmm. hold both in my attention. I couldn't both be wakeful in the way you described to us in terms of you know, being open to the experiences, or, mm -hmm. and have whatever it is right there. And I, so I guess I just I would, one of the things that I feel like can happen with better did happen a little bit is everything just got annihilated. Like Sandy described, pulling out the weeds is mm. pulling out all the weed, right? And it, it just would disappear. And, I, and it's very different than when we do a certain kind of mindfulness practice and something comes up and we just sit with it or interrogate it, or at least that's... Right, this is a different... Right, this is... Destroying things left. You just right. you just go and go and go. Well, yeah, you're destroying things, but by, by doing nothing. Yeah. So in the past, you're saying our practice was very active, using the remedies, using the antidotes, using various kinds of techniques to kind of, like you're saying, <laughs> uh, eradicate things. But in this case, you don't eradicate anything because you understand that it is the nature of good thoughts, bad thoughts, virtuous thoughts, unvirtuous thoughts, afflictive emotions, positive emotions. <laughs> they all have the same nature. They are empty. And if you just let them be and don't discriminate, and don't pick and choose, as we keep hearing. <coughs> so it's, it's cultivating that spacious awareness. And it is said it is like the sun, right? When the sun shines, the, the, the dew and the fog naturally dissolve. Does the sun have to do anything? No, just the light, the radiance of the sun. It just, it's a natural occurrence. In the same way it is said, uh, our, 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 uh, our awareness, again, is like the sun in the sense that it lights up everything equally. Right? The sun will shine on, uh, right? The sun's light shines on everything in this world. Right? Good people, bad people, right? deserts, mountains, lakes, trees, healthy ones, unhealthy, right? The sun doesn't discriminate at all, does it? It just shines its light. And everything benefits from that light. It's the light of awareness that we want to shine, that is not bound by constructs, okay? Yes. Yes. Uh, so in this Buddhist tradition, all the teachings that I have heard so far come from 
Uh, Actually, you want the truth? You know the, who was the prime disciple of Padmasambhava? Her name is Yeshe Sogya. She was his consort, and she was the major recipient of his teachings, and many of the teachings that were shared uh, throughout Tibet uh, were delivered by her. She's, but uh, you know, let's not get into patriarchy at this point. You be the, no, no. you be the, you be the female Buddha of this age. Okay. Uh, so there are. There are, yeah, 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 masters. yeah. There are, we, yeah, yeah. There is a tradition of female masters. Are you know compared to male? Uh, you know, to be honest, you know, f uh, far between. But that's a, that's again, it's more. Those are more cultural reasons. You know, of, of these teaching as well. These female. Yeah, 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 yeah. Great masters. Could you say anything to Mother Teresa? For me, she is a totally enlightened being. She's not teaching, but she was not teaching. Her way of living, of being in the world, with her loving kindness and compassion at work. Good. We need more of that. Yes. Um, I've always been but a uh, you know, that clutch verse in the Diamond Sutra about you know, don't activate the mind, don't sound, sight. Mm -hmm. Activate the mind that doesn't dwell on anything. Mm -hmm. Which is which is what this is the same as this. It feels like this is reverse engineering that. That was always in like an intuitive leap. But instead of activating the mind, it, it, it's like we're dwelling in the place that has been opened by the activated mind. That's because we're asked to wake up the mind. Hold on a second. Are you aware of me? Did you have to wake it up? It just is, isn't it? You don't have to activate anything. It's already here. All you're doing is having to activate your attention to what's already here. This is already here. You didn't produce this, you didn't make it, right? This is your, this is natural, right? this awareness. And, it, and it, it can go here, it can go there, it can hear things in front of you, behind you, right? right? It's already awake. You're already awake, right? We're just asleep at the wheel because we're lost in our delusions and our fabrications. So we don't notice this, right? So at this point, the practice is just notice this. Right? And if you get lost in a fabrication, that's your mindfulness will tell you that and then come right back. This is always here. You don't have to work your way back to this, right? So if I said, please close your eyes, you, please close your eyes, okay? Right. Now open your eyes. <laughs> Wasn't that easy? <laughs> right. Here we are. Right. You know, look how, look how easy that is. Don't make a big deal about it. This is our natural mind. We are awake. When we hear all these times about, you know, we're all naturally Buddhas. We all have, you know, what does this mean? that mean? It means this. We hear it over and over again, but we think it's, it's a, some geographic place that if I, you know, find the map, I'll get there. It's right here. This is it. <coughs> and you don't have to do anything. So, let us stop. So let me just say before, again, this is our, uh, really our final day of practice. I mean, we are practicing tomorrow, but it's a half day and they'll be doing a few other things. Uh, so please uh, really make use of this day. I mean, enjoy it, but it's precious. And, uh, you know, I mean, again, most of us don't live here. Uh, so tomorrow we will be going down the hill.
and we will be in our cars and we'll be driving here and driving there and and uh, wherever we're driving there probably will be activities responsibilities etc so this is a precious day we have okay this is our last day to end and we're together as a community so please uh, enjoy it